Hi everyone, welcome back to Japanese Politics 101. In this series, we talk about different components that make up Japanese politics, and today our focus is on the right-wing groups. If you've lived in Japan, you are very familiar with these groups that ride in trucks, they have flags, they wear military garb, they make a lot of noise. Michael, your favorite group, Uyoko Dantai. Oh yes, my absolute favorite bunch of people to hang out with. <laughs> uh, the, the Uyoku are a, 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 a very visible uh, phenomenon in Japan because this is such a demilitarized and basically pacifist society overall that these highly militant uh, cosplay people who yeah. dress up often in Japan military uniforms of the pre-1945 era uh, they stand out. Right. They're, you can see them all over Japan, but more in central Tokyo because of the, the presence of various embassies here. They're always protesting against the Russian embassy. They're always protesting against the Chinese embassy. From time to time, the Americans get the benefit of that affection too. And it's been a long time since they've gone around the U.S. Embassy. Also, the security around the U.S. Embassy ha is so great nowadays. There's virtually no reason to go there because you, you won't get anywhere mm -hmm. nearby. But if you're going at the, toward the Chinese embassy or toward the South Korean embassy or the Association of South Korean en, uh, Residents, which is on, right next door, essentially, yes, you're going to see these groups. Now, it's not going to be a lot of people, uh, except on certain days. August the 15th is one of their favorites. Because right down here in Yasukuni Shrine. Right, that's right. They, they, do, they do show up a lot for that. It's the day of... Thousands, the, actually. But that's their really big day that you see them. Also, the day that uh, the, the uh, what is called the commemoration day for Dokdo, mm -hmm. uh, for the uh, island uh, in the Sea of Japan, which Japan says is Takeshima, uh, where, however, there are Korean police officers. And they, in fact, the Koreans are having a military exercise right now, defending them against a possible Japanese invasion. Uh, it's a very strange situation there where the exercises against North Korea have been stopped by President Trump, but the exercises defending against Japan are still there. And their point of view, and it's not entirely unreasonable, the South Korean point of view, is these right-wing groups, not Japanese Coast Guard, not Japanese military, but these right-wing groups will or possibly can try to to get to these islands to make a political point, and then we'd have a situation. Right. And they do have a history of doing that. Uh, they frequently uh, land on the Senkaku Islands, even though the government tries very hard to keep everybody off those, those islands in any way possible. Very frequently they get there, uh, frequently as a protest against uh, the Chinese government or the mm -hmm. Taiwanese government. And they certainly uh, make their noises about dealing with the Dokdo Takeshima issue. Right. But they're not just about territoriality. But they're not weaponized either. They're not weaponized unless you count sound. Right. Uh, and uh, they certainly do make a lot of noise. They, they, are, uh, f they have on top of their vehicles, which are painted black, uh, either buses or vans. They crank those decibels up. That they, they has to be illegal. They have speakers on there. Yeah, they are, it is illegal. And indeed, uh, the, uh, the issue has always been, uh, you know. Freedom what, of speech? Well, that's right. Is this freedom of speech or a public nuisance? Right. And one of the aspects of that, that if we could step out for a second, the uh, Abe administration was strongly criticized for passing hate speech legislation that had no teeth, mm -hmm. that had no capacity uh, to Enforcement, punish. Right. Yeah. But the thing is that the police have taken and used that hate speech legislation and used it so as to tell the sound trucks to turn the volume down. Mm -hmm. Because they can then say, look, what you're saying is hate speech. Hate speech is not covered under free speech, which means your loudspeakers are right. too loud. Mm -hmm. They're not expressing freedom of speech. What they're, what they're doing is creating a public nuisance. And they have, I, I work very close uh, to the South Korean embassy, and they have their microphones out, testing the, checking the decibel level, and they jump on these folks, 
immediately if they go past the decibel level, right. which they didn't used to do. Well, even if they jump on them, I mean, what does that mean? The the cars are pretty much armorized, yeah. and even if they're not armorized, it would take a a show of force to pry the doors open, which they won't do. Of course they, they won't, won't go that it. far, so they still crank it up. But the, you have to consider, okay, these groups, what they do, we, we, we haven't described it really, there is a dance that happens. They come yes. in loud, they, they're playing loud uh, patriotic music from the pre-1945 era, and there's someone screaming through a microphone some imprecations in, 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 about Return our island. Return our islands. Get if it's out a, of Japan. If it's the Russians. Uh, stop insulting our country. Uh, stop insulting the emperor if they're passing in front of the Asahi Shinbun. Whatever. Uh, and they use sound as a means for their primary means of trying to intimidate people. Right. right. Uh, but as they approach a truly crucial point, let's say the South Korean embassy or the Russian embassy, suddenly the police leap into action and they have these preset automatic gates that they pull across, and the, these vehicles can clearly crash through right. them if they're on full speed. They, they rush up to the gate and then they stop. Mm -hmm. And it's peculiar, you have to say, there has to be some sort of coordination in terms of uh, finding out when these groups are gonna show up, because these are major thoroughfares. In the case of the Russian embassy, yeah. it's, it's a huge avenue, and they, they are able to, to be prepared and close it within seconds, mm -hmm. and it's just before the bus reaches the barrier. Right. So there, it's clearly a part of a coordinated dance that the, the right wing groups, however fearsome they appear, nevertheless are staying within the law and in fact tell yes. law enforcement we're on our way. Right. Michael, why in this hierarchy of components of Japanese politics does Ryoku hold a, a place of some consideration for us? Well, they, they, first of all, they represent uh, a, an argument about Japan, saying that Japan has been weakened uh, in the post-war era, and if it wishes to be respected, if Japanese wish to be protected, they have to reawaken the fires that existed inside the Japanese spirit. We are From proud. The, we are proud people. We're not defeated. And there are all right. kinds of subgroups that sometimes engage in, in, in rather uh, spirited altercations between themselves. Uh, uh, various flavors frequently having to do with how closely to coordinate with the United States. Some are ultimately ultimately hate the United States. Others see themselves as defenders of this post-war order where Japan is, okay, weak, and we need a big brother, the United States. Right. And so there are all kinds of flavors, and many of them ha are go back all the way to the Meiji period in terms of their ancestry. So these are all kinds of div divided groups. What makes them interesting, of course, is their, one, relation to some politicians, both in terms of they have tried to intimidate certain politicians. Uh, certainly what they tried to do with to one group tried to do to uh, Prime Minister Takeshita uh, was a, a time that, that clearly they, were pro they would come to it where he was and loudly protest. But also because they are also the, clearly the support of some uh, of Japan's very prominent right. uh, conservatives. Mm -hmm. Uh, we would have to say, uh, surreptitiously, of our own governor, mm -hmm. of Governor Koike, uh, because she clearly received the the very conservative nationalist vote. Governor in, of all people. Yes, but in this case, we had uh, a few years back General Tamogami of the of the uh, Self Defense uh, Air Forces. He. Uh, after being cashiered for writing an essay arguing that Japan did nothing wrong prior to 1941 uh, or 45, and that everything that happened was entirely okay, uh, that's not okay for an active duty officer to write that kind of essay, and he was forced to retire. He came back as a politician, and in the Tokyo governor's race, he, he absolutely stunned everyone by getting 600,000 votes. Mm -hmm. Uh, where do these people, where would they come from? Who, why would they vote for him? He's now currently uh, in, deep, in, in deep guano uh, for you know, dipping into his campaign finance funds for him, his own personal use, and he's probably gonna go to jail. Well, that happens very infrequently. Oh, yeah, but, in, but, but those 600,000 in the yeah. city of, cosmopolitan city of Tokyo, 
It tells you something. There's a, that there is yes. a there is a an electorate there. Right. And that electorate clearly went to Koike mm -hmm. in this la, in this last gubernatorial election, and no one wants to talk about right. that. But you know it's there because mm -hmm. she pandered to them. Right. And she pandered to them uh, through saying that she was against the expansion of South Korean high schools. Uh, there's only one currently. There was another one that wants to be built that residents South Korean right. residents want to build. She opposed that, and she's been a, a very clearly a, a right. nationalist. So the right wing does provide votes. It may not provide muscle like it did in the past, but certainly they can intimidate in many cases, particularly uh, the teachers union, mm -hmm. which is dominated by the Communist Party. When you see these guys in action, you immediately um, assume that Yakuza is infiltrated or it is part of a, the Yakuza or the, the mafia kind of organizations that exist in Japan. You see a lot of tattoos. You see big burly guys that are driving trucks or, or muscle cars, that sort of thing. What's the relationship between the Uyoku and the Yakuza? Is, they're, they're not the same. Not necessarily, but a lot of the far right groups are indeed- uh, Philosophically. Philosophically allied, but many of them are in fact simply uh, subdivisions of major gangster gangster uh, organizations, mm -hmm. uh, and they they were clearly uh, organized to provide cover for illegal activities uh, under the aegis of freedom of speech uh -huh. and and freedom of assembly. Uh, you can't you might be able to break up a yakuza meeting, but you can't break up a far right wing meeting because that's protected mm -hmm. by the articles in the constitution on on freedom of assembly. So. Certainly, uh, there is an image, uh, not only of violence, but of criminality associated with many of the right-wing groups. It right. isn't helped by the fact that many of, if almost all of the assassinations that have been carried out, the very few that have been carried out in the post-war era, are by members of these far right-wing groups. Right. Uh, Left-wing uh, attacks on uh, major figures hardly existed, uh, but in terms of uh, the head of the Socialist Party was assassinated by a 17-year-old right wing uh, on live television. Uh, in a very famous incident, uh, there, the attack on the mayor of Nagasaki for having the temerity of indicating that Hirohito, the Showa emperor, had something to do with World War II. Uh, can't he, stand that. You can't say that he was shot in the back. He survived. Uh, mm -hmm. But these right wing groups have been seen as the enforcers of right. a... a a tacit uh, patriotism that mm -hmm. we all have to adhere to, and they're the ones who are the, that make historical revisionism the idea that Japan did nothing wrong and it was just an, one other imperial power. Nanking never happened. Nanking is only thirty thousand people died, right. not three hundred thousand. That's that's not. They provide in that case they provide the muscle and the intimidation and the fear that makes it hard for journalists, right. for uh, yes. writers. To, for and for ordinary people uh, to engage in activities that would be working toward a reconciliation between the powers of Asia. Well, watch it. I mean, I, I'm, I'm assuming that on our program too, since we have mentioned it, we'll probably get a couple of hits from them as well. Well, get some hits from people who are the, either members of or sympathetic to. Uh, and we've been accused of being anti-Abe, anti-Japanese, right. anti, anti our, the country that has been so kind to us. Right. Uh, and it has been. And we're, we're, we both deeply in love the country that we, li we are living in. That's, their, that's part of their, their ilk as well. That's mm -hmm. part of their game as well. They absolutely infest Twitter right. uh, and Facebook and are enforcers there of mass actions against people who have the temerity mm -hmm. to speak out and ask questions about war responsibility or reconciliation. Right. Uyoku, the sound trucks, the kind of attack on embassies and the loudspeakers is one prominent view of, of this aspect of Japanese politics that we're talking about. They're a part of society. They're a small part, a tiny fraction. They make a lot of noise in what is otherwise a quiet country. Mm -hmm. And so they're quite prominent. The other aspect is, is that the net, the internet, has in me, brought uh, many new followers, at least in terms of supporting the ideas of the right wing, than they used to have. Because it's so easy to, to take part and be, be mm -hmm. part of this, these posses that go after right. these people and, and bombard them uh, with mm -hmm. threatening messages. The, the net to uyoku, net to, are, are a famous now uh, phenomenon, and indeed, 
there are people, I've, I've read articles regarding the Niigata election that just happened that we've spoken about, uh, that that election was swayed by messages sent out by right-wing groups that the, uh, the opposition candidate uh, downgraded the abductees, of, uh, from the North Korean abductees, and said that they were just a sideshow, and, and that they pushed a few thousand votes uh. through their negative messaging mm -hmm into the, uh, the government's uh, column, so that they definitely do see themselves as having a, a possibility, a mission. Right. A mission. Mm -hmm. And they do have, inside the political sphere, in the neighboring town uh, of, next to mine of, of Suginami, there is a four-way race, and one of the candidates is a far-right candidate. And it looks like he's going to win because the, the uh, the vote that would normally, if there was only one candidate, go mm -hmm. to the, the mainstream candidate, that looks like it's going to be split, and so it looks like he's going to get through. And when he gets through, he'll change the textbook, high school textbooks, he's going to put in all kinds of the things that the right wing likes to do. The emperor. Return to the emperor system. Honor the emperor. Honor your mother and father. The imperial rescript on education. All of those aspects of the pre-war era that supposedly made Japan dignified and feared. Mm -hmm they want to put in, and that's their program. They've just had to do it surreptitiously and loudly until, until very recently. You can't really capture the essence of Japanese politics unless you understand the role of right-wingers in Japan. Please stay tuned as we continue to explore this topic.